You know those images of space taken by the James Webb Space Telescope? That's not what space actually looks like. To us, at least. The images, in fact, started off as grayscale images and have been heavily manipulated by the scientists working on Webb. So how and why are the scientists manipulating these images? Does it make them any less accurate, any less real, any less scientifically valuable? Let's talk about it. Welcome to Brain Noises. I am Chloe, a science communicator and recovering physicist. And on this channel, we talk about the thoughts that pass through my mind, sometimes relating to science, but I cannot make any promises. If that sounds like something you might be interested in, please subscribe, like, comment. When the images are taken by the James Webb Space Telescope, they are taken in grayscale. Actually, if you want to get really technical, they're beamed back from the telescope to Earth as a stream of ones and zeros that's then put into a matrix based on where they are in the image. They were then formed into a file before being stored within an archive at the Space Telescope Science Institute. The numbers are representative of whiteness and blackness of each pixel, and these pixels then make up the image. So already, before we've even reached the grayscale images that you might have seen around, there has been some processing. This is in order to make it less abstract to humans, but there is more. The raw data has an enormous dynamic range. This means that a lot of the detail is contained in the dark regions of the picture. When you first open that image, it essentially just looks like a blank screen, just black. Image processing software is used that essentially brightens the picture to reveal the hidden subtleties within it. Think about how Instagram has these sliding scales on its brightness option, and when you slide these scales a certain way, texture and stuff is revealed in the shadows that you may not have seen before. This is kind of what's happening here. To create colour views, the team then had to map different wavelengths of infrared light onto different visible light wavelengths. We'll talk more about this later, but this then creates the resulting coloured images. So why are these images in grayscale? They're in grayscale because they're taken in infrared, and the initial images that are captured of space are known as just brightness images. You can think of each pixel on a grayscale image as just how much infrared light is being picked up. You're literally just measuring how many photons hit the detector in that pixel. You're just collecting how much of it is arriving. And although these images look quite dull to us, there is actually a huge amount of information in them, but our eyes just can't appreciate it because that's just not how we were evolved. And that's why they look kind of meh to us. Alexei Filipenko, a professor of astronomy at UC Berkeley, says, if it were just a matrix of numbers or just a zillion numbers flashed across our TV screen giving digital value of the infrared radiation of a particular wavelength at a particular location in the sky, that's not something that our eye-brain combination has been developed to quickly analyse. So why take them in infrared? There are a number of reasons why the telescope has been developed to take these images in infrared. But first things first, I just want to establish that infrared light is part of the electromagnetic spectrum, just like visible light. It just has a longer wavelength than visible light and our eyes have not been evolved to see it. The electromagnetic or the EM spectrum as we know it is obviously very human centric if you think about it. That's why we call that section the visible light section. Whereas if a snake, say, <laughs> who sees an infrared had named the spectrum and created it, they might call the infrared part the visible light part. The James Webb Space Telescope was designed to see in infrared for two main reasons. Number one, due to its longer wavelength, infrared light is less likely to interact with particles than visible light, or light of shorter wavelengths. So this means that it can pass through things like dust clouds without it being absorbed or scattered as much as visible light. So even though there is light of shorter wavelengths out there, longer wavelengths just have a way easier time of traveling and of reaching us. In a similar vein, even if a galaxy is emitting UV light, it loses energy on its way over here due to interactions and often reaches us as infrared light, as energy loss causes the wavelength of the light to increase. So with infrared being a longer wavelength, it increases towards infrared. Expansion of the universe and the Doppler effect also causes lengthening of wavelengths. And this was always one of the main goals of the James Webb Sp Space Telescope. It was to see those incredibly far away galaxies, to see a lot more detail, and the way to do this was to pick up infrared light. One of the image professors who works at the James Webb Space Telescope spoke about it in a really interesting way and it was a fun little way to think about it. 
He said, biologically, we just don't have the ability to see them the way the Hubble or the Webb can see them. So even if we were floating next to these objects somehow, they just wouldn't look like that to us. Think of infrared and night vision goggles that you can wear. Even then, we're sort of using the assistance of the goggles, but often infrared just feels like heat to us, and there's no way our eyes really know how to see all the different wavelengths within it, or just it at all. We just feel, oh, this is a bit warm, and it might be because it's giving off infrared radiation. So how do they decide what color to make the images? Earlier when I was talking about how they make these brightness images, I mentioned how they have different filters. So similar to how you might pick up images with a camera within the visible light range, you do that in the infrared. So they had 29 different filters, I believe, each accounting for a specific different narrow range of wavelengths. These allow you to see how much of each wavelength is in each pixel. And by combining these images, you can create that sort of other dimension to it, the color dimension. Now, this is where it starts to get a little bit questionable. And I think this is where a lot of people have issues. And this is where the kind of accusations of why did I pronounce it like that? Strange. This is where the accusations of faking and the images not being real comes from, is the fact that this technique of just selecting wavelengths in the infrared band and essentially shifting them onto the visible band to obtain what we think it looks like. This is obviously just a way of helping us see the detail in the images and it's not actually a representation of what the image looks like because as i said it's in infrared so it wouldn't look like that much to us and this processing method involves loads of people so although cameras have filters and up until this point they actually regular like your camera and your phone probably works in a really similar way this step of like shifting it from infrared to visible light is a step that involves a lot of people, a lot of humans and, you know, their idea of what they think it would look like. The way they'll do it is the human eye perceives longer wavelengths as red and shorter wavelengths as blue. So they look at the infrared chunk of the spectrum and any of the longer infrared wavelengths they will call red. And, any, and the shorter one's blue, and then in between it's kind of the rest of the rainbow. And that's why I describe it as this shift. The way they talk about it is if you had infrared eyes that were sensitive to light, this may be what you would see. This is what a James Webb project scientist said during a press conference. But even then, you can see with the language, it's a little bit woolly, it's a little bit, if your eyes saw this, maybe this is what you'd see, but it's hard to know for sure. This leads on to a really key point that I think it's just so important to appreciate is that these images, or at least I consider them, a form of data visualization. So when you get any data set, whether it be the ones and zeros that make up an image or the number of ice creams bought in May versus April, you can make a choice as to how to represent them. And if you've done any data stuff before, I don't know if you have, you'll know that there are ways you can manipulate the data to kind of tell the story you want to tell. So whether that be by, you know, if you're dealing with percentages and you want to make the gap between 50% and 60% look bigger, you might start the graph at 40% instead of zero. So whenever you visualize data, there's always going to be this layer of like you trying to tell your own story and a layer of just opinion, I guess. They've been given this raw data and they've chose to visualize it in this way. It doesn't make the data fake. And that's the same for every digital photo ever taken. As I mentioned, like there's been more human steps in the James Webb Space Telescope images, but they're all different types of data visualization. Does that make sense? So we have these incredible images, but are they just that? Are they just there to look at? What is the value in them? Many believe that they are just pretty pictures uh, taken and manipulated to look good to the public and they hold no real scientific value. So first of all, like they are made to look nice so that the public appreciates them. And there is an element of just like making them look pretty for the general public. Uh, and this is because NASA has to communicate the science that they discover 
to the general public because it's being funded by the general public. Um, so a big part of their whole thing is like whatever they discover, they are responsible for getting the public to enjoy it and appreciate it and understand it. But I don't think that means that they should be written off. I think that there is a responsibility to communicate science to people. And even when you're like creating these experiments to have that audience in mind, because it helps you make decisions that are actually valuable for humans and the rest of the world, instead of just being a mad scientist in your lair. Obviously that's an exaggeration, but you know what I mean? But there is a bit more to it than that. So as we know, the gray images look a bit meh, like to, to us at least. And there's a reason why like all this color is overlaid into them. And it's so that the scientists can look at the images and gain stuff from it. There is actually a lot of information in these photos and the colors are sort of faked to help reveal that information. It's not about like making stuff up. It's just about exaggerating certain aspects of it because you know that that's the best way that a human can appreciate it or see it. So yes, if they were black and white, they'd be less impactful, but they would also be conveying a lot less information. I think something I realized as I was kind of writing the video and as I was reading about kind of people being like, oh, they're fake and all this stuff and talking loads about the grayscale images and seeing all these like side by side comparisons of the grayscale and the colorful and being like, those are the ori original images. And it's like, no, the original data was actually loads of ones and zeros. I understand the like criticism of it. I think it's really important to at every stage, like really dissect why these processing stages are happening. But it's, it's, it's just like funny to me how people consider the grayscale images like the truth. And it's like, no, like <laughs> they're not the truth either. There is another element that isn't actually, th that happens way before even taking the photos that I wanna talk about. And that is just selecting the chunk of sky to image, sorry, the chunk of space to image. Before the images were even taken, there was a very intensive process of shot selection. NASA wanted to take shots that really highlighted the science. They were also looking just for a nice frame, a nice structure, a nice opportunity for variation in color. Engineers had a list of about 70 targets, which were selected to demonstrate the breadth of the science. They actually chose them based in part on which would make the best color images. So to return to our Instagram analogy, the images are not just being filtered, but they are being selected. It's the kind of Instagram versus reality. They are kind of just a highlights reel. For me personally, I feel like this type of processing is actually quite important. And I think although the process needs to be rigorously criticized and at each stage you need to question like why you're doing it, I think it's really important to do this processing. I think as long as you know that context, it's good enough for me. But I am curious as to what kind of, like how processing will look in 10 and 50 years time. Um, and how we maybe have changed the way we see the images. So yeah, I don't think I would label them as fake, but what do you think? Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned something. If you did, you might enjoy my last video, which is about the kind of lesser known parts of why we take images of space and why telescopes are great. Please subscribe if you want more of this and comment any thoughts, feelings, any brain noises. I will see you in the next one. Bye.